Well, good morning, everybody. I want to say welcome to all of our first-time visitors. We're so glad to see new faces here every single week. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, is that the best you can do? There you go. That was embarrassing. So I also want to say welcome back to all of our church family uh, and our extended church family that's been missing for a few weeks. So glad that we got to, to see some familiar faces from afar. So welcome back, guys. Uh, I also want to say welcome to our online church family. We have lots of people watching around the world all the time. Um, so I want to say welcome to them. So church family, if you can let our, our in-house and our online family say hello. There you go. So this morning I'm bringing you a motivational message uh, to kind of kick us in the pants and get us moving forward this morning. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be bringing this message to you. I'm going to give you two uh, scriptural references to look for. Since we don't have them on the wall, I'm going to give you a little bit more time to find them. The first one's going to be in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 is the first one. And then if you would also turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So if you want to take your, uh, your, your, your paper, whatever you want to do to put it in 2 Thessalonians 3, we'll be there in just a moment. Uh, but we're going to begin this morning in Acts uh, 1 is where we're going to begin in just a moment. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, there's some in the back, um, and then uh, you need one. Anybody need a Bible right now? I can get some more. Can I get a Bible up here, somebody? Thank you very much. So both of these are going to be on the New Testament, but uh, before we go into Acts chapter 1, what I want to do is set the stage for you this morning and just help you understand exactly what is taking place in these moments, because a lot has taken place before Acts chapter 1. Okay, so Acts chapter 1 is a very inspirational, is a very important book, especially for our New Testament church. All right, this is where we know that we get the power of the Holy Spirit with us. But there's so many new events that took place just before Acts chapter 1, so I want to share them with you so you have a mindset and understanding about what was taking place on the earth during this time. So before Acts chapter 1, Jesus Christ was already on the earth. Okay, he came as, as a baby in the manger, we know that, in, in Bethlehem. He, he lived 33 years already on the earth before Acts chapter 1, all right? He has his 12 disciples, he taught them for three and a half years how to live, his, live life, and he lived a perfect life his entire time here. So he shows us the example of a perfect life. Does he expect us to live a perfect life? He would like for us to, but he knows good and well that we're not God. So we're going to fall. That's the reason we have Jesus. He's the one that covers our sins. But during this time, he also taught the disciples how to hear God, how to understand God, how to study God's word, how to present the gospel to the masses. He showed, Jesus showed the disciples many miracles, healing miracles, supernatural healings, talking about feeding thousands upon thousands of people with just a sack lunch. Jesus showed his disciples all these magnificent things before Acts chapter 1. I want you to understand where we're at this morning. But also before Acts chapter 1, Jesus was tried in this mock trial for charges that he was not guilty of. He was found guilty of, of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, blasphemy of God, saying he was the Son of God, who he was. But he was found guilty of this sin and this wrongdoing and he was tortured. He was beaten front and back, top to bottom. His body was mutilated beyond recognition. His mom wouldn't even be able to recognize him. He was beaten so badly. So all this took place before Acts chapter 1. And the disciples witnessed these things. Now see, the thing is, he just didn't get beaten. He also was crucified. He was nailed on a cross to die. This is not a quick painless death he literally suffocated hanging on the cross gasping for each breath and when the time was right he looked to heaven and says father it is finished and he gave up his last breath and he died see the story doesn't end there either that's just the best part see he was buried in a tomb and he arose on the third day just as he predicted he was going to do he, he said he's going to do these things and he did it so all of this stuff took place before Acts chapter 1. And the witnesses around him on this mountainside at Acts 1 witnessed every single bit of this. This wasn't new knowledge to them. They knew that he was Jesus. He was God. 
So here's the thing. He also told them at one point during the, during the conversations in the last three and a half years that he was going to go away and then come back. And the church, we still have that promise. Jesus is coming back someday for his church. So understand, I want you to grab your mind around what took place in these disciples' in disciples' life before Acts chapter 1. If you're there in Acts 1, say amen this morning. We're going to pick up the story at verse 6 and read through 9. I'll be reading out of the New International Version for those of you that may have a different version than I do. Then they gathered around him and asked the Lord, Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from sight. So I want you to understand, so I want to visualize this event. Just for, I mean, put yourself on this mountain with Jesus, all right? You've just seen your Savior die, resurrect, right? And now he's standing there walking along with him. He's like, I'm getting ready to leave, guys. And all of a sudden, he goes, starts lifting off the ground. And I can just see these disciples going, what in the world is going on now? This just gets weirder and weirder. I mean, first he dies, now he's coming back, but there he goes again. Something new every single day. And I can see these guys just standing there, all of them looking at each other going, you still see him? I think that's Jesus right there. I still see him. He's coming back. Watch this. He's going to come right back. And they stood there and watched and watched. And then he heard a voice way in the back says, he's not coming back. Thomas, shut up. He's always doubting. Always doubting. And they stood there and waited and waited because Jesus said he's coming back for his church. So he's like, he's going to come right back, smash into this mountain, split it open, and we're going to just ride off into the sunset, right? That's the way they, they're just watching it. They just stood there. For the longest time they stood there. And you know some time passed by. Because, because God the Father realized they're not moving. They're just standing there. What are they doing? All right. Angels, go get them. They need a wake-up call. And that's exactly what took place because the next verse describes God's response to their immobility. They're standing there. Verse 10. They were looking intently up to the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? <laughs> you guys are getting the picture now, right? It's one thing to read the scripture, but when you're, they're standing there. Why do you look up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into the heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Just not today. They're expecting him today. So have you ever watched a movie, and I'm sure we all watch these silly movies that are, um, well, I won't say horror movies, I don't like horror movies, but like suspense, you know, drama ones, and the main character's being chased by an animal or a bad guy, and they're just running, and they're running. They get cornered, and they freeze. What do you do? How many of you guys have ever shouted out at the TV or the movie screen and says, don't just stand there, <laughs> do something, right? Don't just stand there. But every single time, they go, freeze, for dramatic effect. And all of a sudden, they die. Because here's the thing. Immobility, inactivity, will kill you. Understand that this morning. So if you guys ever watched Animal Planet, and I, I do that a lot, I really like Animal Planet. There's a lot of things to learn out there in the world. Because there's a lot of cr neat creatures that God has created. And the creatures have two instincts. When they, approach, when they have danger come to them, right? They have two instincts. How, how, you guys know what they are? What's the first one? Run and fight. So fight or flight kick in, right, in the animal kingdom. Which one of those are inactive? Neither. No, and which one of those two, fight or flight, which one of those tells you to stand still? Neither one. So the animals, deer, except for with headlights, they run in the sight of danger right? 
So if we would learn something from the animal planet, animal kingdom rather, the things that God put around us, maybe they could teach us a lesson about fight or flight. Not standing still, staring up at the sky, waiting for something else to happen, but actually being proactive and going after what God has for us this morning. So don't just stand there, we're doing something, right? This idleness that we've been talking about so far this morning, standing still, is also talked about in our second passage this morning in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll be picking up the story at verse 6 in that chapter as well. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you have received from us. For you yourself know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor do we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we cannot be a burden to any of you. So I guess Paul must have listened to my message last week about living an example life to those around him. Because that's exactly what Paul did. He lived as an example to those that that was following him and listening to his teaching. He showed them by living the example of being proactive and moving about the land in, in a productive manner. Okay, He was doing these things. And I would say that Paul, of all people, probably could um, be justified about getting a free meal here and there. Because, I mean, think about it. He's Paul, right? But he did not do those things. He said, I do not want to be a burden on anybody. So he was proactive. He was active always in the, the, the kingdom of God. He was moving about the Father's business. So this is the thing that we have to understand. All of us have a role to play. And we can sit back on our hands and do nothing, or we can say, okay, God, what's my role in the kingdom of God? So, I mean, this is one thing that I'm, that I'm just like blown away by the inactivity of the church in the past. That's changing, amen? We're not going to be sitting back as passive Christians any longer. We do have a voice. We have the power of God. We just learned in Acts chapter 1, when the, whole, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive. Wow, that was weak, y'all. Come on. I'm going to have to edit that out of the tape. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive better, better. So here's the thing. The first answer was exactly the answer from the church normally. I'll receive power. No, 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 no. Listen, church. You are children of the Most High God. You are. You should grab a hold of the promises that God has for you and run with them. And if anybody wants to stand in your way, plow through them. Because you have the power of the Most High God inside of you. And don't let no devil in hell tell you otherwise because he's a liar. Now we're waking up. Good job. For too long, the church has sat back in their comfy chairs and air-conditioned buildings and done nothing as we watched the world around us crumble as children go to school and get indoctrinated by lies and falsehoods that teach them they can pick whatever gender they want. There's multiple different genders. You can be any sexual you know, orientation that you want. I see the most sickening, well, not the most, another sickening uh, you know, thing come up that pedophiles are now trying to appeal to become part of the LGBTQ, whatever it is now, as, you know, be part of that community. I, there's a the thing. That should appall us the same as the rest of stuff because sin is sin, bottom line, right? But if we sit back and do nothing, what's going to change? Nothing. Because here's the real truth. The church saying nothing and doing nothing is still speaking. It's still speaking, all right? Of us doing nothing, it's still talking to us. That is why Sunday school is so important for our children, Even if we only get an hour and a half a week to our children, it is so important for us to proclaim the gospel message over our kids. So important. We cannot forget to keep praying over our children because that is our future. We're going to mold them and shape them however we want to see them done. And if we sit back and do nothing, nothing will change. Hmm. Now don't, I mean, so we need to start changing things all over the board. And I'm not suggesting for the mo- for even the least that we should be doing the same thing as these, you know, a- Antifa or whatever there are, you know, these people, these, uh, you know, one word, only one letter different from Antichrist and Antifa. It's kind of neat. I've seen that the other day. So 
we, I'm not suggesting we should, you know, riot, loot, vandalize. I'm not saying that any, anything like that. That's just stupid. Because you know what? We have a way more powerful weapon than spray paint and bricks. Amen? We can tear down the strongholds of the enemy if we would actually stand up and be a church. Jesus Christ did not die on that cross and resurrect on the third day for us to sit back and go, that was fun. He wants us to go out there and win the lost and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Enjoy life. Enjoy life. Walking around like a bunch of sourpusses, man, I don't want to be a part of that group either. We should have life and more abundantly, right? That's what the word says. So how about we start living our gospel life that he has for us? Hmm. This glass half empty mentality that we walk around with, that's silly. I mean, we've, we had a pretty rough week here at church. You know, everything that we had for technology died. So what? I'm pretty sure I heard worship, but I still hear the word of God being preached this morning. So the power can be cut off. The roof can be torn off. It doesn't matter what it is. The gospel message is still going forth because I still got breath in my lungs and so do you. So don't look at the glass half empty, man. And you know what? If we're sitting back waiting for Superman and Batman to fly out of the sky and save us, it ain't going to happen. The only way we're going to change this nation is if we do it. The only way we're going to change the, th the world around us is if the church will actually grab a hold of the promises that God has for our life and do it themselves. Hmm. Last Wednesday, we were at the Bible study, you know, and if you don't go to Bible study on Wednesday, I really encourage you to go. It's so uplifting. It's a midweek pick-me-up that I need. I'm sure you guys do the same thing. But last Wednesday, we're going through Romans chapter 10. And Romans 10, I really did enjoy that. I've been enjoying, especially 9, 10, and 11. Looking forward to 11 next week. But one passage in, in, in Romans 10 has stuck out to me. And as I, I've been gnawing at my mind ever since we, I began to study that a week or so ago. Uh, and that's Romans 10, 14 and 15. So Romans 10, 14 and 15, it says, How then can they call on the one that, have, that they have not believed in? Talking about unbelievers. How can the unbeliever call upon the name if they don't believe in him? And how can they believe in the one who they not heard? So think about it for just a moment. There's no way an unbeliever can come to Christ if, one, they haven't heard it. So if they haven't heard it, they can't believe in something, right? But it keeps going. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Oh, wait. That means the church isn't doing their job, right? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Anybody sent by God around here? Everybody. Don't just look at pastor. He's the one that's sent. No, 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 no. I was sent to be the pastor of this church. You're sent to go reach the masses. That's your job. I can reach, we'll say, 20 people a week. What about you? You can reach 20 people a week. Collectively, now we have 200-something people gathered every single week, right? Hmm. So, how are we going to do this? We're going to go do it. That's what we're going to do. Stop talking about it and be about it, right? Because, I mean, there's so many times we sit back and we pray for people to be sent over there, right? Lord, you see what's going on on the south side of town. We got to pray for those people. We need to pray for those people. We got to pray for those people, right? What if I told you you were their answer to prayer. Think about it for just a moment. These young men and women on drugs and alcohol, depression, suicide, their parents know that they're going through this stuff. And their parents have been praying for that individual for how many years? Right? And they may not even live in the area. They're saying, God, send someone to my son. Send someone to my daughter to reach them. What if you are their answer to prayer? Think about that for just a moment. You have the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. I don't have more power and authority because I'm your pastor. I have the same power and authority as you do. I'm just walking in it. So here's your obligation and it's your choice is to walk in it as well. Remember a moment ago when I said you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When you were saved, born again, blood bought and redeemed, the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you and gives you power to proclaim the gospel and move about your day. So don't brush this off, guys. Don't say, oh, someone else can do it. God's sending you. He's sending me. He's sending all of us to go reach the lost. Because here's what we do. We sit back and we stare at the sky and go, 
man, I hope God comes back and saves that person. They really need it. You need to hurry, God. Yep, another one died. Chicago, we're losing 20-something people a day. While we sit back and go, man, that's bad. I wish you would do something, God. He is. He's sending you and you and you and me. He is doing something. So don't just stand there. Do something. Do something. Because here's the thing. The same Jesus that changed your life, changed my life, he wants to change their life too. They're not forgotten about. They're not too far gone. They didn't have the right last name. God doesn't care about any of that stuff. He died on the cross for their sins the same as he did yours and mine. And he's sending us out to reach them. While I was studying this out, God reminded me of this, of this uh, I guess a story in Matthew chapter 22. And I love this story. And as I read this story, I literally stood to my feet when I read this last part of it. And I think you'll understand why once we get to it. I'm going to read the first six verses of Matthew 22 in just a moment. Because it talks about today, 2020. Jesus Christ knew exactly what was going to take place from here till eternity. So in this moment of time, he told the disciples this story about 2020. He just didn't leave, he didn't put the date in there because it'd throw people off. Verse 1 says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to the ones, to those who had been invited to the banquet, to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized the service, servants, mistreating them, and killed them. Verse 7, watch this. The king was angered. And he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Have you guys seen any cities burning lately? Perhaps we can call Minneapolis or Atlanta. Uh, we'll call Seattle, New York. See if anybody's anything like that going on around the world. Here's the thing. Jesus, or God the Father, called his church a long time ago. And for a long time, churches were full. People were doing things. People were gathering but they weren't doing they were just gathering right and now whenever the rubber meets the road jesus is like okay i need you guys to go gather the people in it's time for the banquet it's time for the feast so i mean this this parable is not hard to grasp that the king represents god the father it's so easy right the banquet has been set all right this banquet that's about to take place is called the marriage supper of the lamb that's already been done. He hasn't been served yet, but the food's prepared. The lamb is ready, okay? Jesus Christ has already done everything. So now it's time just to ring the dinner bell and call the kids home for this great meal. And when the time came, God rung the bell, and the church was like, I'm busy. I got this thing next week. You know, Billy has this football game that I don't want to miss. Um, the game's on. I got a lot of excuses. I got, I got a lot of excuses, but for sure, I love you. I mean, I, I want to be there for real, you know. And that's what's going on here in, in the world today. God's calling people forward that used to know him, used to serve him, used to run alongside with God, calling them for this banquet. And they're like, I'm good. They stood there and they're busy. And as you can imagine, anybody ever made a huge dinner or a big banquet, or a, anything like that, and then nobody shows up. A little anger rises up inside of you. What was the point of doing all this if they don't care? So you can see why God might be a little upset with the church that was supposed to be chosen by God. But they just knew about him. They weren't knowing him personally. So he got upset. God does. 
and decides to throw out the last group and says, okay, forget it. If you want to be sleeping, you want to sit back on your hands and do nothing, fine. I'll call somebody else. And that's where we pick up the story again in Matthew 22. Verse 8 says, Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite invite to the banquet anyone you can find. Not the select. Not the ones that look pretty. Not the ones that wear their tie just right and their hair just perfectly combed. Invite anyone that will come to my banquet, is what the Lord says. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and I'll throw in the ugly, you know, so I can get in there. Gather all the people they could find, the good, bad, and the ugly, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is God's desire, is to have his kingdom full of people. So when the first group of people says, you know what, I'm busy. I don't have time for these. I don't have time to serve you. I don't have time to go after the things that you've told me to do. I'm too busy about myself. God says, I'm going to go grab some more people that will love me. So here's what I'm going to tell you this morning. Our church dynamic is going to be changing. Our demographic is going to be changing. All right? The good, the bad, the ugly, and everybody in between is going to be coming into the house of God. Why? Because that's what God desires. And the only way they're going to come in is when we go get them. Because here's some staggering facts for you, okay? Over 6,000 to 10,000 churches close every single year in the United States. Grab that in memory for just a second, right? Think about that. Six to 10,000 churches close because 2.3 million people are walking away from their faith right? God says, fine, have it your way. I'm going to bring in a new church, a new people. I'm going to go gather the ones that will love me and serve me so we can have this banquet in the sky like nobody's ever seen, right? Here's another number for you, all right? Make sure I got the number correctly. 70, where'd I go? 76% of first-time guests, okay, come because they were invited, They came because somebody says, hey, do you want to go to church? 76% of everybody that comes in came because someone invited them. That means 24% came in because see people prayed. They they, they, they had the advertisements out in the street, so it doesn't matter what that is. They came, so 24% of the time it works. 76% of the time, hands-on work works. Okay? So why do I keep saying that we're going to go out in the streets? Because it works. I mean, statistically, it works. Why not do that? Still pray, still expect, but also evangelize. Now we're reaching 100%. We're praying, we're advertising, but we're proactive with our faith. God is sending us to go reach the lost. He's sending us. And if we sit back and do nothing, that's what we're going to have is nothing. And I don't know what God will do against us, because if we're not doing it, There's no fruit on our tree, and what does Jesus say about the dead limbs and the fire? I don't want to be cut off from God. I want to be so attached to that vine that I don't have to worry about nothing, that I know God's leading me. One thing that's so amazing about God, and I'll share this with you, and you probably already know it, that God doesn't look at your past and make that determination of what your future is going to look like. He doesn't see you as this or this and say, you'll never make it as a deacon or an elder, right? He doesn't see people like that. He says, the past is forgotten. I am making all things new. So here's the thing. If God does that, so are we. So as long as I'm your pastor, we're not going to push anybody out of this church. I don't care what they look like. I don't care where they're from. I don't care about their habits or hangups. God's the one that's going to clean up my life and theirs. There's enough Jesus for us all. So this morning, church, we're not going to sit there staring at the sky saying, God, I want you to do something. We're going to start moving. We're going to be the ones that are doing it. Even for the only church, even for the only people on this planet going to proclaim the gospel message, we're going to go. Why? Because Jesus Christ sent us out there. He told us to go. I'm the Great Commission. What's it say? Go and make disciples. And all the nations, baptizing them, teaching them the way they should go. That's our job. Our job. 
Not praying for someone else to do it, but that's for ours. So church, I want to grab and just picture this for a second. If we just bring in 76% more people in this congregation, what does that look like? And what if, this is going to be crazy talk, but bear with me. What if those 76% people, they get the fire, they get the vision, and they bring in 76% more people? What does that look like? It's an unstoppable force sweeping across this nation. Because here's what the Bible tells me. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Right? All flesh. Not just the perfect people. Not the ones that have been going to church for 25 years, and they have this lingo down. God bless you, brother. I don't care what people look like, what they smell like, what they sound like. Bring them in, guys. God wants to save their soul the same as he does ours. Amen? So don't just stand there. Don't just stand there any longer. Tomorrow, we're going to start doing this. We began last weekend, we're going to do it again. I talked to Pastor Sellers this last week. Man, help me. He found out that we're, well, I told him, that's how he found out, that we're going door to door. I told him on Wednesday. And, wow, there it is. So Wednesday, I told Pastor Sellers that we're going door to door. We're going to start evangelizing. And later that night, we got hit by lightning. (laughs) That's okay. That's, That's the way I did too just now. I was like, oh, okay. So Thursday, Pastor Sellers calls me again. He goes, I can't sleep because of what you told me. He said, I am so excited. He says, is there anything I can do to help you? He says, it's been my desire to see all of Philip saved. What can I do to help? I said, praise God. He's, eight, he's 91 years old. I said, you can do whatever you want. I'm not going to stop you. You know? I said, we could definitely use prayer. Pray that more people get on board with this thing. But you know what? The power of God is in this. I know it. That I, I have no idea what, what's going to take place in the next week, next month, or next year. I have no idea. All I know is I told God before, I'm telling you the church and making it public, I'm all in. I'm all in. I don't care what it is. I don't care where I have to go or what I have to say or whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm not taking pies to the face for the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what it is if it reaches the lost. It brings the interest of God in their life. Because looking back at what we just read in, 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 uh, in Romans, how will they know if we don't go? How will they know? And he's the one that sent us. So this morning, church, don't just stand there, but go. When every head bowed and every eye closed, I've got one more passage that I'm going to read with you. But right now, what I want you to do is really search your heart because all of this stuff is really good information. It's motivating, it gets your blood going. But if you're not bought, born, you know, or you're not blood bought already, you're not born again, your sins are not forgiven, you're going in vain. Because God's not in it. So what I want to do is I want to invite you to join this family. I'm not asking you to join a church. It's not about the church anyway. It's about Jesus Christ. But I want to invite you to give your heart over to Christ. You know, and one of the, the saddest answers I've ever heard from somebody when I asked, are you saved, was, I hope so, or I think so. That's a sad answer because you know what? That's not what God has told us. Romans 10, 9, it says this, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's no reason to question your salvation. There's no reason to question your eternity. There's no reason to even have to worry about those things a moment longer. Because if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Word of God says you will be saved. So this morning, church, I want to invite you to join the family of God. And maybe you've never put your faith and your hope into Jesus Christ, and you want to do that this morning. You want to be part of this you know, movement and this revolution that God's doing, I want to invite you to join us. Not this church, but this family that loves you. 
So right where you're at, if you would like to just ask God to forgive you for your sins and wash you clean so you have that salvation, knowledge, and faith, I just want you to raise your head and look at me, and I'm going to pray for you. Amen. Yep. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Father. So right where you're at, I just want to ask you to keep your head bowed. I'm going to invite the entire church family to do this together. Because we are in this together, church. We're not singling anybody out. All right? So I'm going to pray, and I'm just going to ask you to repeat what I'm saying to you. But not just repeat it with your mouth, because that's pointless. These are just words. But however, when you say it from your heart and really mean them before God, that changes everything. So this morning, if you're ready to change your life forever, repeat these words with me. Heavenly Father, I admit that I have sinned. I've done a lot of things that I'm not proud of. And I need your forgiveness. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for my sins. I also believe that he resurrected from that grave. He ascended into heaven and now sits at your right hand. Father, I ask you to heal me of all my sins, all my darkness. Take away my shame and make me more like you. Father, today I proclaim you as Lord of my life. Jesus, I love you. Amen. Church, if you just prayed that from your heart, you have exactly what I just read. You shall be saved, and you are saved. So the next time someone asks you, are you going to heaven? You can put your chest out and go, I sure am. Because of Jesus Christ, you are saved and redeemed. So church, what just took place in this sanctuary is the beginning of what God wants to do through your life. Sharing the gospel message. Now, you don't have to have a 14-point illustrated sermon to reach somebody. A cup of coffee, a conversation, a knock on the door, and a friendly smile may be all it takes. But do me a favor. Don't just stand there. Do something. Amen? Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for watching with us today. I hope you were blessed and encouraged by this video. I want to invite you to worship with us next Sunday. To make it easier to find us and stay up to date with all of the other videos, I want you to hit the subscribe button at the bottom of this page. This way you never miss another thing. If you want to reach out to me, you can go to our website and scroll all the way to the bottom of the home page. That website is www.vccphillips.com. You'll see a space to send me a message at the bottom of that page. Thanks again for watching and remember, God loves you. See you next Sunday.